Hey everyone, really excited to jump into our next fireside chat with Sam Altman. Sam is the CEO and co-founder of OpenAI and the former president of Y Combinator. Sam and I first met when Scale was actually going through the Y Combinator program back in 2016. Sam is one of the people in technology who works on the most interesting set of problems in both technology and hard tech between AI, nuclear energy, and synthetic biology. Always excited to chat with Sam on the future of AI. Sam, thanks for coming. Thanks, Alex. One thing I wanted to start on is I, you know, we mentioned this list of uh, diverse and wide-ranging topics that you work on, from AI to nuclear energy to synthetic biology. What inspires you to work on these problems? I mean, I do like trying to be useful, and I wish I could give like some like really sort of selfless answer. But honestly, I sort of like to have an interesting life, and I think these are the most interesting problems in the world. I think AI is, um, like, if AI even gets close to where we think, if it really is this sort of technological revolution on the scale of the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the computer revolution, um, those don't come across every lifetime. And so the ability to work on that is, uh, I feel super lucky and it's amazing to work on. OpenAI has had some incredible breakthroughs in research over Thank the you. past few years. And it's, it's been truly incredible to watch from the outside. What do you think sets OpenAI apart from other AI research organizations? I think we have a, maybe a unique or at least a rare combination of we are we are good at research engineering and the sort of safety policy planning thing that think tanks usually do and we have all of those in one small organization that on a per headcount basis is extremely well resourced and extremely focused so we're willing to concentrate a lot of resources into a small number of bets um, and bring these sort of three different pieces together to do that um, you know we sort of we have a plan that we think goes from here to AGI I'm sure it'll be wrong in important ways but because, we're, because we have such a plan, and because we're trying to think about how the pieces fit together, and we're willing to make high conviction bets behind them, uh, that has let us make, I think certainly relative to our size and capital, um, outsized progress. Super interesting. You know, one question I have is how, how intentional was this you know, magical mix of, of uh, multidisciplinary uh, interests on your team as well as the, the, the strategy, or is this sort of emergent from assembling a group of very smart people who you enjoyed working with? I mean, I'd say both. Like, we intentionally thought that to do this well, you would need to put everything together. And then when we looked at the landscape out in the world before OpenAI, most of the groups were really strong in one of the area, maybe one and a half, but no one in all three. And so we very consciously, like, we call those the three clans of OpenAI, have always wanted to be good at all three. But then the other thing is, I just, like, I think really talented people that are focused together in one, not only one vision, but one plan to get there is, like, that is the rarest commodity in the world. And uh, like the best people are, are, you know, Steve Jobs used to say this, I think more eloquently than anyone else, but the best people are so much better than the pretty good people that if you can get a lot of them together in a super talent dense environment, you can sort of surprise yourself on, on the upside. The, the sort of the central learning of my career so far has been the exponential curves are just super powerful, always underestimated, almost always underestimated and usually keep going. And so in some sense, like, by the time we started OpenAI, it was clear that these curves were already going. Um, it was clear that I think the biggest miracle needed for all of AI, which was an algorithm that could learn, was behind us. We can have better algorithms that can learn, we can learn more efficiency, efficiently, but once you can learn it all, once a computer can learn it all, then if you sort of think about that from first principles, a lot of things are going to happen. And so that, like, the miracle was already behind us when we started, um, and it then became a process about doing uh, like a really good job at just executing on the engineering, sort of figuring out the remaining research breakthroughs and then thinking about how it all comes together in a way that is good for the world, hopefully. Sam, you're, you're such a good student of history, especially in terms of, uh, you know, the, the situations, the events that led to many incredible innovations in the past, like the internet or GPS or even the computer originally. Um, what, what lessons do you learn from those, the histories of these incredible technologies and how do you try to apply those into your work at OpenAI? Okay, I have a non-consensus answer here. I study all of those things. They're all like super interesting. I do love reading about history. Um, but I think most people sort of over-rotate on that. 
it's like always tempting to try to learn too much. Um, it's always tempting to say like, what do the atomic bomb people do? Um, what can we learn about climate change? And I think every, there are themes, um, you know, the stuff, there, there's some similarities and you would be very stupid not to try to take those into account. Um, but I think the most interesting learnings and the most interesting way to think about it is like, what about the shape of this new technology? What about the way that this is likely to go is going to be super different than what's come before. And how do we solve this with all of the benefit we've had in the past, but really not trying to apply that, um, really trying to think about the world today, the quirks of this particular technology and what's going to happen is going to be different. Um, I think AI will be super different than nuclear. I think it will be super different from climate. I think it'll be super different from Bell Labs. And uh, I think most people that try to do something like this uh, take too much inspiration uh, from efforts in the past, not enough. Yeah, super interesting. So how, how do you pick the, um, you mentioned that OpenAI, you know, part of the strategy has been to uh, be relatively concentrated, pick a small number of bets yeah. that, that you guys have high conviction on. How, how do you go about picking these bets and, and what, what represents a good bet versus a bad bet? Do more of what works is part of the answer. And I think weirdly, most research labs have a do less of what works approach. Um, you know, there's this like thing of like, oh, like once, once, you, once it works, like it's no longer innovative, we're gonna go look for something different. We just wanna build AGI and figure out how to then safely deploy it for maximum benefit. But if something's working, even if it then is like kind of like a little bit more boring and you have to like just put in a lot of like grunt work to scale it up and make it work better, we're really excited to do that. Um, we, don't, we don't take the approach that personally makes very little sense to me, but seems to me what most research labs in most fields, not just AI do, of do less of what works. Um, so we have like some thoughts, we may turn out to be wrong, but so far we've been right more than we've been wrong, about what it takes to make general purpose intelligence. And we try to pursue a portfolio of research bets that advance us to those. Um, when we have scaled something up as much as we can, when we have gotten the data to be as good as we can get it, um, and we still can't do something, that's like a really good area to go do novel research in. But again, the goal is to build and deploy safe AGI, share the benefits maximally well, and whatever tactics it takes to get there, we're excited about. And sometimes it's surprising. Like sometimes you can just really scale things a lot. Sometimes something you thought you would work needs a really new idea. Um, but we keep finding the new ideas and we keep finding how to make bigger computers and get better data. Yeah, so, so you know, one of the, the super interesting intellectual questions that you know, many people engaged in AI have kind of all pondered on is, um, you know, AGI is this thing that at least theoretically is certainly possible because you know, it's, sure. we accomplish it through our brains. And, and there's this interesting question of like, what is, the, what is the technological path to arrive at, at AGI actually look like? And obviously this is, a, um, this is almost a philosophical question more than a, a, a sort of technical, a real technical question. But based on what you know today, all the research you all have done at, at OpenAI, yeah. what you've learned through that research, what, what do you think is the most likely path from here to something that represents AGI? Either creating AGI in a computer um, is a certain possibility. Um, either physics all works like we think, and we're living in the physical universe, and consciousness is, the intelligence is sort of this emergent property of energy flowing through, you know, in your case, a biological network and the computer's silicon, but, but, but it's gonna happen. Or um, we are living in some sort of weird simulation, or we're like a dream in universal consciousness, or nothing is like what we think. And in any case, you should live as if it's certainly going to happen. And so I, I still find it odd that people talk about like, maybe it's possible. It's, it's like one, you, I think you should certainly live as if it's possible. Um, and do, do your work as if it's possible. In terms of what we need, um, you know, we don't like to talk too much about unannounced research, but, but certainly I think most of the world, ourselves included, have been surprised by the power of these large unsupervised models and how far that can go. Uh, and I think you can imagine combining one of those that sort of understands the whole world and all of human knowledge um, with enough other ideas that can get that model to learn to do useful things for someone that would feel super general purpose. Yeah, you, you, in, in that answer you brought up one thing which I think is, uh, that I, I'm always very impressed by with you, which is kind of this thought, which is you might as well believe that the technology is possible because if it is, it kind of changes everything. Yeah, there's like this old philosophical debate which is either like, let's sort of say Descartes was right, and you can either, you can say that like, 
I have this certain knowledge that I, I, I am, I exist, my own subjective experience is happening, and you can't be certain of anything else. So like maybe this is all like, you're in a virtual reality game, you're dreaming, it's like some apparition of a god, whatever. Or like, it really is just like physics as consensus understanding is, but in that case, like, it's totally possible to, to recreate whatever the subjective experience of, of self-awareness is. And so it's like either you believe that physics is physics or not, but in the or not case, then like something else is very strange, so who cares? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, well, the other part I was going to mention is that y it's uh, part of it, part of I think what is, what you mentioned to find your career is like this belief in exponentials. And I think if you have a strong belief in exponentials, then the question for these great technologies is never like yes or no, it's usually when. Yeah. Right. For sure. Um, that, that is another, I think, uh, if you can like train yourself to overcome one cognitive bias, bias to sort of like maximize value creation in your own life, this is like the one, right? It's understanding these exponential curves for whatever reason, evolution didn't prioritize this. We're very bad at it, but it takes some work to overcome. But if you can do it, yeah, it's super valuable. It makes you look like a visionary. There's actually a lot of, uh, uh, of neuro neuroscience research that shows that, you know, people uh, in their brains, they have circuits to do all sorts of, uh, you know, mental operations like addition, like subtraction, et cetera. We're very bad at exponentials. We can, that. like, catch a ball or throw an arrow or something. Yeah, it's not an exponential. We can That's do parabolas, parabolas, apparently. Parabolas. Yep. That's where it ends. Okay. Um, and this is another, you know, in some sense, also a philosophical question, but you know, how obvious do you think it'll be when we develop our first system that represents AGI? You know, there's a few beliefs. There's one belief where, you know, it may kind of be this emergent uh, circuit in the middle of this like giant soup of, yeah. of stuff. And we might not even understand that it exists when it, when it emerges. I don't think we'll understand it when it emerges. I also think that it won't, this is like pure speculation. I think it won't be this sort of like single moment in time. It'll just be this exponential curve that keeps going. Um, but there will be something that emerges that's quite powerful that takes us a little while to really understand. Do you have a, do you have a personal sort of Turing test of something where if it happened, it would be sort of evidence that, that uh, we've achieved it? In terms of something that's like, people always use this term slightly differently. Something that's like self-aware or something that's just like really generally intelligent that can learn fast. What do you mean by it? Uh, generally intelligent, can learn fast, capable of doing, like given enough, um, given enough education sort of can do anything that humans could do. Yeah, I think that's actually like not a super hard test for, for what you were just saying. Like there's like a lot of, that would be so economically valuable to the world that it will show up that way. And so like once it can start doing some significant percentage of human labor really well, that would pass the test for me. Yep. Very cool. One topic that's really come up a lot, um, especially recently, is this topic of, of responsible and ethical AI. You know, yeah. I think any, any powerful technology has the ability to, that, that will change the world, has the ability to be, uh, you know, responsible, ethical, good for the world overall, or bad for the world overall. How do you think about ensuring that the, the benefits of AI are, are equally distributed at OpenAI? Yeah, um, two principles here. Uh, one, I think the people that are going to be most affected by technology should have the most say in how it's used and what the governance for it is. Um, I, I think that this is something that some of the existing big tech, tech platforms have, have gotten wrong. Um, and I believe most of the time, if people understand the technology, they can express their preferences for how they'd like that to impact their lives, and how they'd like that to be used, and how to maximize benefits, minimize harms. But in the moment, people don't always, me included, people don't always have like the self-discipline to not get led astray. So I can certainly say that I, my best life is not like scrolling all night on my phone, like reading Instagram or whatever, but then like on any given night, I have a hard time resisting it. And so I think if we ask people, like show, show people like, here's this technology, how would you like it to be used? You know, what, what do you want the rules of this advanced system to be? Um, that's pretty good. Uh, and then this, and I think we'll get pretty good answers. And the second is, uh, I really believe in some form, and there's a lot of a asterisks to be placed here, but in democratic governance, um, if we if we collectively make an AGI, uh, I think 
everyone in the world deserves some say into what that system will do and not do and how it's used, how we share the benefits, how we make decisions about kind of where the red lines are. Um, I think it would like be bad for the world. Um, it would lead to like, it would be unfair and it would lead to a not very good outcome if a few hundred people sitting in the Bay Area got to sort of determine the value system of an AGI. Um, along, on the other side, like sometimes in the heat of the moment, democracy doesn't make very good decisions. So figuring out how to balance these seems, seems really important. Um, but what I would like is sort of a global conversation where we decide how we're going to use these technologies. And then, you know, my current best idea, and maybe there's a better one, is some form of a universal basic income or basic wealth sharing or, or something where people get to sort of, we, we, we share the benefits of this as widely as we can. Definitely. Um, you know, one, one thing that's, that's super interesting about AI is just, it's a, it's a very different paradigm from a lot of technologies yeah, before. Yeah, that's right? hard. That, I think that always makes it hard. That's hard with any new technology. Um, but for me, it seems, and maybe everyone thinks this in their own era, but it seems particularly hard with this one to reason about because it's so different. Yeah. And one of the, you know, one of the super interesting things that's, this has really come up in a lot of um, recent instances of AI is this problem of, of bias that arises from the data sets, right? And, and, you know, if you talk to some folks like Andre Karpathy has been very public about this, you know, the, there's a belief that, you know, data really does sort of 80, 90% of the programming of these, the true quote unquote programming of these systems. How, how much scrutiny do you think um, we should put as a community into the data sets and the, the code and the algorithms, you know, sort of relatively yeah. in the development of responsible systems? Um, I mean, I think what we care about is that we have responsible systems that behave in the way we like them to. And if we can, and again, back to this sort of like do more of whatever works. If we can get there with data alone, that'd be fantastic. If it requires some intersection of data and algorithms, which I suspect will be the case, plus sort of real-time human correction and user correction, um, that's fine too. So I think we should have a design goal of responsible systems that are as fair as possible. Um, sort of the do what the user wants as often as possible. Um, and I think it will take all of the above. Certainly, I think there's a very long way to go with better data. And that has been, if you sort of think about the holy trinity here is data compute and algorithms, I'd say it's still been the most neglected. Yeah, and I think that was a really, um, out of OpenAI, there was this amazing paper, Scaling Laws for Large Language Models. And I think that was the, the, the understanding, the, the sort of scientific understanding of how that holy trinity interacts, yeah. I think was a... I'm also, you know, someday we're gonna get to models that can tell us the kind of data they need and what data they're missing. And, uh, and then I think things can get better very quickly. Um, you know, one of the things that we, uh, we spoke to with one of our other uh, fireside chats was Drago Angulov, who's the uh, head of research at Waymo. And one of the things that he discussed was there's this natural, um, almost misalignment where, you know, neural networks are very good at optimizing for average loss functions. That's what, they're just incredible at that. That's what they're naturally good at. And that, you know, uh, the loss function is not representative of what your design goal is, you know, as you mentioned. And so how do you think about, how do you all think at OpenAI about this kind of, um, this misalignment that's created by how the technology is developed between what you actually want the system to do and what, what your loss function tells the system to do? And, uh, and how do you think about aligning those over time? Yeah, I mean, this touches on the earlier question about bias. This is why I think answering, this is why I think it's not only about, this is a gr one example of why I think it's not only about data sets. I think this is like a, a sort of an interesting example for how really how we did precisely how we design these systems and what we optimize them for uh, has a bunch of effects that are sort of not super obvious and depending on what you want the system behavior to be um, the algorithmic choices you make are really important yeah so you know there's been a number of incredible breakthrough uh, results in the AI research community over the past few years uh, many of them coming out of open AI like GP3 and clip and dolly um, one of, the, one of the trends has been that these uh, breakthroughs require more and more data, more and more compute, and more and more concentrated engineering resources. And so it seems to be the case that the, the sort of effort required to do great re research is increasing by quite a bit, um, and the resources required is increasing. How do you think about this impacting kind of the, the landscape of, of research for AI? I don't think I entirely agree with that. I would say to build the most impressive sort of 
useful systems that does require huge amounts of data and compute. Um, so to like make GPT-3 or 4 or whatever, that requires a large and complicated and high amount of various types of expertise effort. And there's only a handful of the companies in the world that can do that. But the fundamental research ideas that make those systems possible can still be done by a person or a handful of people and a little bit of compute. Uh, in fact, most of OpenAI's most impressive results have started that way and only then scaled up. So uh, it sort of makes me sad to hear researchers saying, well, I can't do research without a 10,000 GPU cluster. I really don't think that's true. Um, but, but the part that is true is to, to sort of scale it up into the maximally impressive system that someone else can use. Uh, that is going to be a narrower and narrower slice that can do it. Yeah, so I, I think it's interesting. I think it's, um, A, I, I do think it's empowering for you know, as many researchers and prospective researchers in the audience today to believe that um, you, you, should, you should certainly believe that it is possible to do great research for sure. independent of, of all these resources. But given what you just mentioned, which is that to create the, yeah. the most advanced systems with, with, the, uh, with the, the highest performance for other organizations to use requires lots of resources, how do you think that, uh, what do you think that means for what the right collaboration between you know, the research community, industry, and government needs to be for maximal benefit of AI technology? I don't think we really know that yet. I mean, there's going to clearly need to be some, but like collaboration is always tough, right? It's always like a little bit slower and, and a little bit more difficult to get to work than it seems like it should be. And so uh, what I am most optimistic about is that there will be organizations like OpenAI that will sort of be at the forefront of creating these super powerful systems and then will work with this government, other governments, um, sort of experts in other fields to figure out how do we answer these hard questions? Um, what should we do with this system? How do we decide how we all get to use it? So my guess is it'll be something like that. Yeah. You, you, one question I, that I think is, is interesting um, to ask regarding OpenAI is what are, the, what are the bottlenecks that you all have experienced in scaling up OpenAI? Um, and, and do you think those are reflective of the bottlenecks you'll continue seeing? Like scaling up the organization itself? Uh, the organization and the research and results altogether. Honestly, very standard, boring. Like there are these things that work in a 20 person organization that don't work in a 150 person organization and you sort of just have to accept somewhat more process and planning and slowness in exchange for dramatically more firepower. Um, but I don't think there's like a deep thing unique to OpenAI here. You know, one thing that is, uh... You mentioned before how, how OpenAI works and, and why you think it's, it's been so successful, but oftentimes it's the North Stars of these organizations are, are so important for how they'll develop over, over decades. How would you describe the mission and sort of the overall North Star of OpenAI? I think I've said it a couple of times without meaning to, but our mission is to build and deploy safe AGI and maximally spread the benefit. And it's like simple, it's easy to understand. It's like really hard to figure out how to build safe AGI, but like at least it's clear what we're going for. Um, and if we miss, it won't be because of uh, a vague mission. I really do believe that like good missions like fit in a sentence and are pretty easy to understand. And I think ours is, and that's like very clarifying whenever, um, whenever we need to make a decision. The thing that I think we could do better at that I think many or almost all organizations could do better at, even people who get the mission right, is the tactics. I recently heard of the CEO who wore a t-shirt to the office every day with his like top three or five priorities printed on it. And I was like, that is a good idea. Not only like should the CEO do that, but everybody at the company should wear a t-shirt with that every day so everyone's looking at it when they're talking to somebody else. That's the thing that I think people don't get quite as right. It's, uh, I, I know that CEO, and there's a, there's a uh, work remote version of that, which you set your Zoom background to be your top few Interesting. Opening, I just crossed its, its five-year anniversary. Is that yeah, right? uh, yeah, I think so. Um, and so it was founded a little more than five years ago, I think. Uh, you know, my assumption would be that in the past five years accomplished a lot more than, than what you had expected. How have, you know, maybe when you started it, what were your expectations for what would be possible within this time frame, and, and how, how have you done with respect to those? I mean, this probably speaks to just like absolutely delusional level of self-confidence, but basically I thought it would go exactly like this. Exactly like this? Yeah. You thought uh, GPT-3 would... would uh, I mean, not like, I didn't know it was going to be called GPT-3, but I thought we would be like about here by now, and I'm thanks to like a lot of incredibly hard work from a lot of very smart people, here we are. 
So where do we get to in five years from now? I don't like to make public predictions with timelines on them. Where do we get to next, vaguely? I think if you, I, I think like one very fair criticism of GPT-3 is that it makes a lot of like stupid errors or sort of, I mean, it makes it, it's like not very reliable. And I think it's pretty smart, um, but the reliability is a big problem. And so maybe we get to something that is like subjectively a hundred times smarter than GPT-3, but 10,000 times more reliable. And then that's a system where you can start imagining like way more utility. Uh, also something that can sort of like learn and update and remember in this way that GPT-3 doesn't, you know, the context is gone. All of your sort of, all of the background of you is gone. If the system can really um, sort of remember its interactions with you, I think that'll make it way more useful. I think uh, one thing that's kind of happened within uh, the field of AI research is, is this uh, incredible up-leveling of, of what it means to do AI research. So, you know, originally, if you were to think maybe 20 years ago, um, to build world-class AI systems, it would involve a lot of hand feature engineering yeah. of, of, you know, and a lot of like manual parameter yeah. training to do things correctly. And then uh, kind of with like more modern machine learning methods, that kind of went away. Then it was more, maybe more about hyperparameter tuning yep. and identifying the right architectures. And that was where, you know, 80, 90% of the work went. And then with the recent breakthroughs with the transformers, all of a sudden the architectures are just copy paste. Yep. And, and so it's been this like leveling up, leveling up, leveling up. Where do you think this, this goes? What do you think are the, the things that we do today that, that, you know, take up a lot of our time with machine learning research that, you know, in the future are gonna be meaningfully automated. We still have to write the code. I mean, when the AI is like writing the code for us or helping us to write the code. Do you think it'll happen soon? Again, no time predictions. I think it'll happen at some point. And I think that will like meaningfully change people's workflows. What are some of the, the short term use cases of AI that, that you think are, are sort of right around the corner that, that you believe are gonna be very impactful for the world on the whole? Um, that, that people you know, maybe aren't thinking about or aren't expecting? I don't think I have anything like deeply new or insightful to say here, but um, you know, if you think about the things in the world that we just need a lot more access to high quality versions of, um, you know, everybody should have access to incredible educators. Everybody should ha have access to incredible medical care. Um, we can make a long list of these, uh, but I think we can get there pretty soon. I think I, I can imagine sort of like, you know, GPT-7 doing these things incredibly well and, and that having sort of like a really meaningful impact on quality of life. Yeah. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, that's, it, it's really great. And I think we can see glimpses of that in GPT-3. Yeah, sort of for the, sure. The power of it to understand. Super early glimpses, but it's clearly there. The, the, the ability to, to sort of distill human knowledge is, is really yep. incredible. Today, there's more and more people going into the field of ML and machine learning research than you know, ever before. And if, if you were to uh, give a few words of, of sort of direction to this, this community of people who are all coming into machine learning, all, all looking to do incredible work in the field, what, what would be kind of um, a few vectors of, of sort of direction that you give, uh, you give this community to be maximally impactful to humanity? Uh, I will pick only one piece of advice for a young researcher, which is think for yourself. Uh, I think that this is like pretty good advice for almost everyone, but something about the way that the academic system works right now um sort of it feels like everyone should be doing this like really novel research but it like it seems so easy to sort of get sucked into working on everybody else is working on and sort of that's how the whole reward that's what the whole reward system optimizes right and and, and the best researchers i know in this field but really most others too are the ones that are sort of willing to kind of trust their own intuition to follow their own instincts about what's going to work and do work that may not be popular in the field right now. Um, just keep grinding at it until they get it to work. Uh, and th that's what I would encourage people to do. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of to, to wrap up uh, with respect to, to AI and everything that's, that's been happening today, you know, I think there, there's uh, kind of as we discussed before, there's very few mental models that people can have to actually understand uh, how how to think about AI and how it will change the world just because it's a new technology yeah. with new uh, fundamental characteristics. Um, one of the things that, that, one topic that really interests me is 
how, what are the kind of uh, the changes to the physics of economics that AI will, will encourage? You know, I think when uh, software first came out, there was an interesting change where software required a lot of cost to develop, but was, uh, was you know, basically zero cost to reproduce. Yeah. That was an incredible thing. What do you think are some of the, the uh, qualities of AI technology or some of the, 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 the sort of characteristics of AI that you think are gonna meaningfully change how we think about the, like, the physics of our economic systems? Well, like, you know, the cost of replicated goods went to zero with software. I think the cost of labor for like many definitions of the word labor should go to zero and that like makes all the models very weird. So if you had to pick like one input to the economic models that is not supposed to be zero, kind of like my expectation is that's it. And the, you know, there's been this long standing push of too much power, in my opinion, shifting from labor to capital, but my intuition is that should go way further. And I think like most of the interesting economic theory to go figure out is how to counteract that. Um, there's all these arguments about like, is it gonna be deflationary, inflationary? It seems like obvious it should be deflationary, but I think there's these other like things that are weird, like what it does to time value of money. I, I actually don't know if he certainly said this, but I've always heard attributed to, to Marx the quote that uh, when the interest rates go to zero, the capitalists have run out of ideas, which is sort of interesting in a world where we've been in zero rates for so long. Um, but like, maybe we get a lot more ideas really quickly once we have AGI and maybe something crazy happens with interest rates. I, I think all of that stuff is hard to think about. Yeah, super cool. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining for us, sure. Sam. It's always interesting to talk to you about these ideas and uh, uh, we're very thankful for how thoughtful you are about them. Thanks for having me.